So now that we've got our replicated DNA, uh, the next issue is that it doesn't always work perfect. Um, the errors occur and then the cell has to somehow have some sort of error repairing mechanism or if the error goes uncaught, then we're going to see some interesting variation in the genome. So nucleotide bases can transform a little bit into these tautomers. Tautomers are isomers, but there are special class of isomers where there's only an electron or a proton shift. But so what happens if these tautomers get included into the DNA strand is they can actually kind of mismatch up thanks to those um, proton rearrangements. And you'll get these um, anomalous base pairing alignments down the bottom. So it's, if you have a tautomer of cytosine in this rare form, it'll actually bond with adenine and you'll have a thymine uh, guanine bond. They're accidentally making three hydrogen bonds there instead of two. Luckily, there is a system that goes back and tracks these changes because they do change the conformation of the helix a little bit. So how do we make sure that we don't have these um, misalignments thanks to the isomers of the nucleotide bases? And while DNA polymerase can backtrack a little bit, okay, it can actually sort of ting, 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 ting back, remove that base, and then continue forward in the five prime to three prime direction. So it will kind of, it doesn't back step very far, maybe only I think one or two bases it can go back, but it can proofread and double check and excise the incorrect base and then move forward with the rest of replication. So cell division has a check and balance system here too, where if too many uh, mutations accumulate, the cell will actually die, right? So cells survey their DNA to detect damage and then can sort of trigger different synthesis pathways and stuff to prevent further cell division, sort of a uh, check on the um, anything that might be like a malignant cancerous cell. And then if the DNA is really toast, uh, more damage accumulates over time and the cell undergoes apoptosis and this, you know, programmed cell death. Otherwise, if everything is fine and your damage is repaired, then the checkpoint's released and then we go into cell division. So let's say that DNA polymerase didn't catch a mismatch here and then it's detected. There's actually a set of proteins called mismatch repair proteins that remove not only the mispaired base, but the whole chunk of base on the strand. And then DNA polymerase can find that th open three prime end and then continue um, synthesizing the rest of the strand. And then DNA ligase will come along and seal the gaps. So we've got four main types of repair processes for DNA damage that are all extensively described in your book. We've got direct repair if we've got methylated bases. We've got base excision repair uh, if we need to pop out just uh, one base at a time. Nucleotide excision repair where it takes out a whole chomp of the one side of the DNA strand. And then if we have a break in our double strand, we have break repair that can go in and fix that for us. There's another type called UV damage repair. Uh, photoreactivation because what happens with um, UV damage is it causes these thymine dimer pairs here where thymines actually link together instead of to the um, uh, opposite adenines and so that uh, needs to be broken up and got my pen on okay. so there's um, the UV light damaging the, the thymine dimers and then in many organisms there's a actual enzyme that sees this and breaks it apart, but you do need light in order to repair UV damage, so it's called photoreactivation. Light harms your DNA, but you also need it to fix your DNA. All right, we're going to talk a little more extensively about the types of mutations that's in the book. I just want to add a couple extra um, notes in there. So this is from the old book. Um, and we're going to mainly look at uh, origin, whether or not a mutation is spontaneous or induced, what kind of cell it's expressed in, somatic or germline, um, and the molecular change, okay, so how the DNA is changed, and then the effect on translation, okay, so whether or not it, it's silent, missense, nonsense, or frame shift. We will talk about expression and effect on function maybe a little more in a later chapter, so don't worry too much about those two. So we'll start with molecular change. What exactly does the mutation do to the DNA sequence? And here we have an interesting uh, visual made of gummy bears, toothpicks, and fat twizzlers, I think, of a um, substitution change, a deletion, and an insertion. Okay. 
So insertion deletion is kind of lumped together a lot of times, called an indel, not an um, incel. Uh, one is terrible and the other is, is fine because it's DNA, all right, where we add and remove base pairs, okay? So it will basically will cause a frame shift unless it's in a multiple of three. If you add three or take out three, the um, translation will proceed as normal and not switch around the amino acids that are getting added. But if it's not in a multiple of three, then it will get shifted. Okay, so this can be caused by slip strand mispairing during the replication phase. Just a bit of a ooh, chink, and something gets added or removed that wasn't supposed to be in there. Okay. Uh, and then we have our substitution where a um, base is changed, okay, but it doesn't add or delete anything. It's just a one to one change. And so there's two types of those. We have a transition where a pyrimidine is replaced with its other pyrimidine, or a purine is replaced with the other purine. Uh, whereas a transversion is when you actually switch the types and that may bulge the helix structure. That's where you have, so you have two, now you have two pyrimidines trying to stick together or two um, purines trying to stick together and that really contorts the shape more than the um, transition does. Okay. So here are the, again, the transitions and the transversions. Now uh, there's more ways to have a transversion, but it turns out the transitions are more common. Um, they're more likely to be um, just left in the DNA there. So uh, we looked, there's this interesting paper about um, nuclear DNA and this mite species that are, that are asexual, and that there's a lot, the rate of uh, transitions that occur in the DNA over time is much higher than the rate of transversions occurring in the DNA over time. Okay, so next we have um, at the level of the codon, depending what uh, codon is produced, uh, we can have a, a couple variations here. We can have um, sense and nonsense. I don't really like that figure, so we're going to use mine. Okay, so here's um, what our substitution and point mutations will, will do once you get into the um, what amino acids are going to be coded for okay, in the, by the DNA sequence. So here's our uh, no mutation here on the left. A silent mutation, okay, um, means that the amino acid that's produced is the same, okay? Even though there's uh, a change in the DNA that does not actually translate to a change in the amino acid residue. In this case, lysine, there are multiple codons that code for lysine. So if you switch them out, it doesn't end up making any difference to the, to the protein and then to the phenotype. Okay. A nonsense mutation is one where you change the DNA and suddenly there is a stop codon where there shouldn't be. Okay. And then a missense mutation is where you change the amino acid uh, because of, of that mutation. And in this case, we have two types of missense mutations. A conservative missense mutation means you replace that uh, amino acid residue with something that's very similar. It's likely going to do kind of the similar thing, so it's not a big deal. Whereas the non-conservative missense is you replace that amino acid with something totally different, like a, you switch to polar for a non-polar or positively charged with a negatively charged, and that's going to have a big effect on the protein structure down the line. Okay, so just go over again. Our silent, also known as a synonymous mutation, you're not changing the amino acid. Okay, and this is due to the degenerate nature of the genetic code, where multiple codons code for the same amino acid. All right. And then a nonsense mutation, we uh, change that amino acid to stop codon. And then with a missense mutation, we've got two of those, either conservative missense, where it's a very similar amino acid of the same type, or it's a non-conservative missense. We have a very different amino acid and a different type altogether. So whipping us back to indels for a second, um, they cannot be silent mutations because they're always removing or adding amino acids. Now, even if they, they add an amino acid of the same type, that doesn't matter. It's still in addition to what was there. They can't be a silent mutation. And um, insertion deletions generally cause frame shift mutations, unlike point substitutions that don't. So the next thing about mutations I want to talk about is the origin. Like, why did the mutation occur? We've got two, two reasons, basically. It happened totally randomly. That's either random mutation, spontaneous mutation, no chemicals were involved. It was just some sort of cellular-based error in DNA replication. Might have been a transposon jumping, or maybe something happened during crossing over, but there was nothing like out of the ordinary pushing this mutation into existence. Okay, and we can look at the rate of mutation or mutation rates, okay, that are the probability of a change in the DNA sequence occurring in the span of one uh, generation. 
So when we want to say um, if some chemical or some toxic thing is changing uh, DNA, we're going to look at the mutation rate of DNA when exposed to that substance and not exposed to that substance. We can determine whether or not a mutation is induced or spontaneous. So if we look at our mutation rate and find that our mutation rate has increased, okay, in the presence of, say, some sort of noxious chemical, we're going to say that's a non-spontaneous mutation. It's actually an induced mutation. It's occurring in the presence of a mutagen, okay. Now, mutagen, a physical or chemical agent that changes genetic material, usually DNA, but could be RNA, of an organism, and then increases the frequency of mutations above the natural background level. level. We see an increase in the mutation rate. Okay. So radiation, one of the first uh, things confirmed to be a mutagen. Uh, Herman Muller basically found that he could in increase the number of mutations he'd see popping up in fruit flies by exposing them to x-rays. And then found that x-rays are also inducing mutations in humans and rang the alarm bell like crazy that, hey guys, if you're doing any sort of x-ray activity, you need to be wearing protection. And he was ignored for a long time until people everybody who worked with x-rays started dying of cancer and then people started paying attention to what he was saying. Okay. You can also have a chemical mutagen, so like mustard gas that was used in World War I also increased the mutation rate in fruit flies. Okay. So um, there's a whole lot of different chemicals that cause mutations. Um, tobacco use, alcohol use, um, a lot of nasty industrial chemicals and things. But then we also have chemicals that cause cancer. Cancer is when the cell like basically forgets how to do a program death when it becomes mutated. So there is definitely a link between this increased mutation rate and an increased rate of cancer too. Okay. So we got a couple of terms here. All right. So we've got carcinogen is something that a uh, a substance that causes cancer. And then we have things that are mutagens that cause mutations. Not all mutagens directly cause cancer. Okay? But then we have something that's an even broader topic called genotoxics, anything that damages DNA, okay, which may cause mutations, which then may cause cancer. But that's sort of the broadest class of something that's genotoxic. Next, if it definitely damages DNA and causes mutations, you have a mutagen. And then if that causes cancer, then you have a carcinogen. So you might see these terms out and about, probably carcinogen the most, but I just wanted you to know how those all line up. Okay. So how does this lead to cancer? So somatic mutations are ones that are occurring in every part of your body except for the parts that are actively producing eggs and sperm. Okay. So these mutations are the ones that are going to kill you, but they're not going to particularly kill your um, children. All right. Very bright. Uh, note on the topic there. Okay, So a mutation occurs in a cell and if the cell is behaving properly like an essential function or something, the cell just undergoes cell death. It dies. Okay, um, If the mutation affects some other function that doesn't super matter a whole lot, it'll carry on and it'll divide and it'll carry on that mutation, but it's not really doing anything too terrible, so you're probably fine. Now if your mutation affects a gene that has um, something to do with cell division, either a tumor suppressor gene that is keeping the cell um, from dividing like crazy, or a oncogene, a, cell, a gene that actively causes the cell to divide and, and cause cancer. Now you have cells that are proliferating without any normal control sign growth, and that is what we broadly describe as cancer. Okay. So the problem here is if we get a mutation that affects a gene associated with cell division. It's the start of most cancers. Okay. So a proto-oncogene is a form of oncogene that has not been mutated yet. Okay. And then we have our tumor suppressor genes that could break or affect the core processes in the cell. And so there's a whole bunch of these genes, anything from ligands to receptors to transduction proteins to transcription factors. And people have been working on this for quite a long time. They've come together with this, you know, lists of all these cells that when they look at a cancer and have sequence the DNA or RNA and be like, what went wrong? What gene got affected that led to this? They're starting to find all these different um, genes in the pathway of, of cancer, basically. Okay. So there's a driver mutation is the one that is whoop, 
okay? Actually changing the transition from, from normal growth to unregulated growth. But then there could be other mutations as well that are just along for the ride. So they arise and accumulate. The cell is dividing. There's no checks and balances. It's not checking the DNA for errors. And those passenger mutations just keep occurring now that there's no brakes. Basically, you're in a car with no brakes, and off it's going. And somehow you're accumulating more and more passengers at, uh, along the way. Okay? So this is one of the reasons it's been so hard to determine what genes cause cancer and stuff, because you have all these other mutations that are going along for the ride, and you have to sort out, well, wait, are those causing the cancer, or were those just there because you've got super proliferating cells all over the place? But we're getting better at that, especially now that sequencing is so cheap. Okay. So, and that's where people were, you know, weren't sure what the genes were for because the passenger mutations are affecting such a wide range of other DNA.